Coming up also, we'll talk to Tanya Powers, that whole latest situation on the Virginia governor, who is claiming what? He was the guy in the picture, the racist photo, but then he wasn't. And now I think he says he still isn't, but um, needs more time to determine whether or not he's going to step down. It's, Crazy, right? Yeah, it's unbelievable. And had this been, I'm sorry, I have to say this, had this been a rep- just like, can I make an analogy? Yeah. Do you know the hit on Jared Goff as he was running out of bounds in the Super Bowl? He had one foot in bounds. Yeah. Right. Had that been Tom Brady, 15-yard penalty, there's no question about it. If this is a Republican governor, there's marches, there's protests, there might even be like literally fighting that's going on in well, the Well, there streets. are marches and protests, just for the record. I don't know if you're following, but uh, <laughs> there are. Uh, to call for this guy to to, uh, to to step down. And Democrats are calling for him to step down. The one who has not, though, is the guy that campaigned for him. And I don't I don't agree with your your oh, assessment. I, but let me tell you what I what I, I totally don't because it's all over the news. It was the lead story on NBC last night. Lead story. You should step down. However, okay. here's where I'll make you happy. Um, the one person that has not come out is Obama. And Obama campaigned for him. And and if that had been Trump that had, okay, I'm coming with you here. If that had been Trump, they would be attacking Trump. They are not attacking Obama, although that is a story. But it's uh, it's not the big story it would be if it was Trump that uh, had, had uh, campaigned. Fair enough? Fair enough. Yeah. I did not follow this story yesterday. I most of the information I know about it came from uh, this weekend. But wow, this uh, this this and there was a story where I believe during Anderson Cooper, the graphic that was put up uh, had him on the lower third had him as well. Uh, Anderson Cooper did call him a Democrat on camera. The graphic uh, called him a Republican. Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting little faux pas right there. So, and, and can I ask one more thing before we move on from this? How does that picture in a medical, not medical school, is it a medical school or law school? It's medical a medical school. school. How, How does that, that even in, get in? in? The, right. Well, apparently in uh, in Virginia, I ah. guess. I don't know. Um, you know, Christine Bellino's always told us it's a different world down here. I believe it now. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Syracuse plays tonight. I uh, the president's uh, State of the Union is uh, is tonight. That's going to be very interesting. Probably one of the most anticipated I can ever remember. Um, and I I do wonder if he's going to call for a, a national emergency. And you know, Nancy Pelosi will be sitting right behind him. That's going to be interesting. Syracuse playing tonight. Uh, Florida State is that the uh, game yes. tonight? Okay. Here's a question: How is Syracuse of the twenty five teams that are in the top twenty five? How is Syracuse not in at least in the top twenty five? You know, it's in, really ridiculous. They're losing ground too. This latest yeah, poll that came out, thirty or something now. Yeah, they only got three first place vo- or three votes, I should say, in the uh, AP top twenty five, and they got no votes in the coaches poll. And if you remember, this was probably a month ago now, but they were like kind of right on the outskirt. They had yeah. like thirty five or forty votes in the AP poll. They're down to only three votes. So. I win tonight. Help Florida State. I think is ranked twenty second in one and twenty fourth in the other. So I don't they know. are if a they, ranked if they, team. If they beat Duke twice, do they make it into the top twenty five? And where would they be? Twenty five. I mean, this is because some of the teams that are ahead of them is are, are it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I love a do over on that Buffalo game. Um, Buffalo got beat by uh, Bowling Green over the weekend, which was a shocker. They yeah. were dancing on the court. There was about 50 people and the players dancing on the court because they beat Buffalo. Uh, coming up this morning, we'll uh, talk to Rachel Sutherland. Also, a little preview on the President's State of the Union. Peter Franklin, the Gabby Cabby is on. And it is announcement week. A lot of local candidates are announcing this week. And so far, Andrew, we have we what? We have the District attorney running for re-election. Scott McNamara has announced that he is rerunning and uh, or running for re-election. We'll have him in studio this morning. Yep, that'll be for his third term. Um, also, uh, Tim Julian, former Utica mayor, announced that he will be running for Ed Welsh's seat, which uh, he will not be running for re-election. You Ed know, Welsh we won't be. We spoke with uh, with Tim before the first of the year, and uh, and he did say he was considering a run for something. But really wouldn't quite say exactly what it was. Now we know what it what it is, and I think that he's just been uh, wanting to be uh, 
wanted you a part of the process. Right, and he says he's got a, a lot of plans, a lot of initiatives that he wants to bring to the Board of Legislators. Well, what I love most is that uh, he'll bring excitement. That's it. Because oh, yeah. he won't come or go quietly. That's always... Uh, that, and we'll speak and, with Jim uh, this morning, uh, who's in studio at 7 o'clock this morning, and we'll chat with him about... Uh, what he plans. And one of the interesting ones early and uh, somewhat surprising is Michael Galimi, the Republican Utica Common Council president, will have a Democrat challenger in Judy Galimo. That's going to be very confusing. Um, yes. Do I vote? Is it Galimi we're voting for Galimi or is it Galimo? Galimo. Hmm. I don't know. That'll be quite interesting. But Judy is the uh, CFO at uh, LB Security and Investigations, and she's on several boards, and she has announced her candidacy as a Democrat for Utica Common Council president yesterday. We're working to get her on, too. So. You'll hear people in the booth, uh, which one is the woman? Which one is the guy? There, there, there'll be a struggle here. Help me! Is it A or an O? Uh, Tiny J. Powers standing by right now. We're just speaking about this topic. The uh, Virginia governor who has still not stepped down. What do we uh, What do we know here, Tanya? Good morning. Yeah, apparently, good morning. The governor has been meeting with the staff, did that yesterday to try and assess whether, you know, he can stay in office, whether it's viable. Uh, there have been a lot of calls growing louder, actually, for him to step down. Uh, he has uh, apparently not made that decision as of this point. Um, he says, you know, he's taking things into consideration. Uh, this, of course, comes at the same time that the lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, um, is denying an allegation, which is uncorroborated. Uh, I also need to add a sexual misconduct allegation. Um, it was apparently stemming from a 2004 encounter with a woman. He says it was consensual. Uh, he is calling the whole thing a smear. Um, the Washington Post actually said uh, yesterday that they were approached by the woman in 2017 and that they investigated uh, but didn't publish anything because they couldn't, you know, right. they, they couldn't corroborate the whole thing. So what really hurts this, uh, this governor is that initially he came out and apologized, right, um, and didn't deny that it was him. Now he's kind of changed yeah. his tune a little bit and saying, well, that, I, don't think, I don't think that was me. Boy. Uh, exactly. I yeah, think this I would... is from the, the 1984 medical yearbook, medical yeah. school yearbook page, and he initially apologized for appearing in the photo, and then he said a day later that he wasn't in it. Um, you know, he there was a very odd press conference in which he did admit to um, – you know, making his face darker at one point for a, a dance contest where he was dressing up as Michael Jackson, um, but that the one the photo was not him. Yeah. The worst part about that whole thing was that his wife had to step in at that press conference when he was talking about Michael Jackson and say, "This isn't the time," because somebody asked him about the moonwalk and basically his he was going to answer, and his wife was like. It's probably not appropriate for you. Yeah, but, <laughs> were they asking in the middle do, of the press yeah. conference to do the moonwalk? Yeah, that was that was, uh, that I think was the not a good look. The reporter's question was, "Can you still do the moonwalk?" And he <laughs> and he was going to answer, or maybe even do it. And his wife, who was right oh, next to him, was Lord. like, "You should probably not do that. It's not inappropriate." Yeah. Not oh wow. Man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's quite something, really. <laughs> wow. Um, and there's another part of the story uh, Manaski led this morning talking about uh, he feels that if it was a Republican governor that the outcries would be stronger. There are protests calling for this guy to step down. Uh, but the one element that uh, that I look to is had it been President Trump that was campaigning for this governor, I, I think there'd be a lot more outcry because former President Obama did campaign for him and he has not come out to denounce him or ask him to step down. Yeah, it's. I think we hear that every every time that there's something that happens on yeah. on one political side or the other, the other one goes. Well, if it had been yeah, us, that's right. You know, there would have been a lot more. And there's, I mean, there's been uh, a ton of of outcry about this. I mean, like I said, he's. You know, there are people, there are delegates in his own state uh, who have said. You've got to go. Yeah, you know, yeah. Not, not Republicans. I mean, you know, they... I, I, just to give you an idea of how bad the uh, political scene is, um, uh, what's his name from Maroon 5 that uh, performed in the. Uh, Adam, the Adam, Adam Levine. Adam Levine. Yeah. Had Adam Levine come out in support of President Trump and had he not told Fox News that he didn't want them to play his music anymore, I'll bet you there'd be a lot of people on the other side cheering his performance on Sunday night and you'd hear a lot of Democrats poo pooing it. 
that's how political we are. It, it actually merges and filters down into entertainment as well. It's pretty oh, crazy. It, it's everywhere. You're yeah, right. Yeah. Can't escape it, Tanya. You have a no. wonderful day. Thanks so much. Thanks. Tanya J. Powers from uh, Fox News. Uh, speaking of the uh, speaking of the Super Bowl, the official Twitter account for Sunny Delight tweeted a weird message during the game the other night. It said, "I can't do this anymore." Did you see this? No, but I didn't even realize Sunny D was like a drink that people still drink. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Maybe they were talking about the boring game. That's possible. That could be. I can't do this anymore. Declining sales, maybe? But some people day? thought it might have been a depressed employee. Uh, it's not clear which it was, but the next day the company was enjoying the whole thing, so some people aren't amused. Um, uh, I don't know that we'll ever find out exactly what it was unless someone comes out, but I think the reason they're not coming out and solving the non-mystery called a mystery <laughs> is because they're getting, believe it or not, they're getting play out of it. Yeah, why, yeah, I mean, why, why put an end to something good? You know who yeah. we didn't see at the Super Bowl was the Fiji Water Girl. I was, I was surprised she wasn't on the sidelines uh, or in, uh, a, in for a play or something. One of the big stars of the uh, of the year. One of the big surprise <laughs> stars of yeah. the year. And according to a new survey, are you ready? Eighty eight percent of Americans say they are happy at their jobs. Eighty eight percent. Do you uh, are you surprised by that number? Yes. Yeah. Really. Yeah. The way people are constantly complaining all the time. Yeah. There is a lot of complaining going on, um, and they actually use. That's, I mean, that's almost nine out of ten people say I'm happy. That is correct. That they're happy at their jobs. Yeah. Maybe it's just not there. There might be elements they're not happy about, but basically they're there because guess what? You could always pick up and and go somewhere else. I know that's not as easy as it as it sounds. But uh, but you could leave this day and age. Well, there's that whole vocal minority thing, too, where, you know, a lot of people that you hear from don't like their jobs, but they're the ones that are always talking about it. So, yeah, that could be, too. Uh, we're going to have uh, full uh, news coming up next. Uh, pa- Peter Frankel with Gabby Cabby in a bit. Also, uh, Rachel Sutherland on the State of the Union, a preview of tonight's State of the Union address, which will be at 9 p.m., this evening on all the uh, all the networks. We'll have it here as well. We'll uh, get to it. Coming up, 6.30 at WIBX. What up, Mara? I, I heard this story yesterday. yesterday. It was yeah. hysterical. Uh, he's a recent vi- uh, here's a recent video from his YouTube page where he talks about how we shouldn't automatically respect our elders, including our parents. It shouldn't be automatic. You don't have to respect them. What is this logic? Your parents are two people who just wanted a good night together and then they had you. You don't have to respect them for that. Uh, Having a child makes your life in society much easier. They owe you, if anything. They oh claim that they gi- you give them joy when you were born. Many now, do you of- think this is done in uh, tongue-in-cheek? No. No, I think no, he's I think this think guy's serious. 100% yeah. serious. But I think this is a sign of the times, too. Somebody ought to, to punch this. him in the face. Yes, I, I love that. Uh, they just wanted to have a good time at night. You know, and, and uh, you, know, he might, you were the byproduct. <laughs> he might have a point, I think, on that first point. However, there's a tremendous responsibility in raising a child. Well, it is possible that they just wanted to have a good time. Right. Okay. Um, it is also possible that they planned and they chose to have a child. Right. Um, additionally... It's nature. That's what. That's how it's made to work. You're, we 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 populate the world by the fact that there is a desire to consummate your relationship. And isn't his and procreate big argument that he wasn't able to consent to, to being birthed? So I wonder right. at one point that's was, a little was there some right? phone call that you can make? Yeah, is there yeah. some uh, letter that you can write to, to yeah. ask permission for that? I don't know. Ten-year-old Girl Scout in Los Angeles named Kiki Pashal posted a music video online to boost sales. She raps Girl Scout cookie lyrics to the Cardi B song Money. Like, been in this game since 2014, selling them cookies is my thing. <laughs> Buy thin mints or even s'mores. Please open up when I knock on your doors. <laughs> oh, That's funny. I don't know. I might I might say after that. Nah. I, I yeah, don't what was, was the piano riffs in the band? It wasn't good enough. It wasn't that's, a riff. It was just Cardi like a, a note. Oh, is that it? Oh, is that how Cardi B does it? No, With the was, piano? Or, whoever, whatever song they said she was rapping. That's Cardi B. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Money. Money. <laughs> uh, Rams tackle Andrew Whit- uh, Whitworth summed up their Super Bowl loss in an interesting way. He said, you can't pout or feel sorry for yourself. Don't do that. And here's why. 
Coming soon. You're not going to get me to pout and, and feel sorry for myself. Uh, I realize what this game means. I cherish the crap out of it. And I don't give a crap if you have a Hall of Fame bust, if you are you know been a pro bowler or win 20 Super Bowls. At the end of the day, you're all going to die, and you're all going to have the opportunity to be, play football or not be playing football. And who you are, how you carry yourself, whether you pout and, and feel sorry for yourself is the only thing that's going to matter because that's what people are going to remember about you. Um, you know what? And, and so for me, what means the most is that guys see me hold my head high, uh, they see me confident in them and loving them and, and uh, there for them in any way I can moving forward. Yeah. <clears throat> I was with him for some of it. And then there was the whole, well, you know, you know, you play, you have your career and then you die. And that's about it. Uh, have you seen this uh, woman, this uh, Marie Kondo yet? No. She's the uh, Japanese writer with a book about getting rid of clutter. Oh, and is this the one you've been watching on, uh, on the Netflix? My wife watches it. Okay. Yeah. I think it's Netflix. But the whole thing is that um, you it you have to get rid of clutter, and the way you get rid of clutter is by getting rid of things that don't bring you joy. Ooh. I think it's joy is the word. And like for instance, that shirt um, clearly it brings you enough joy to put it on and and wear it. Uh, but you might have some shirts at home that you haven't worn, and you look at it, and you know it used to be this shirt used to bring me joy, and now it doesn't anymore. So I'm getting rid of it. Okay. Yeah, that's her whole thing. This couch over here doesn't bring me joy anymore. Boom, it's gone. Wow. So there are now people out there saying, yeah, I bought into this whole thing, and now I'm upset because I got rid of stuff I didn't want to get rid of. Yeah, it happens all the time with, like, divorce and stuff. I didn't have joy at that moment, but I'm yearning that that joy right now. Anyway, she is huge right now. She has a Netflix show. It is Netflix called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. She's actually tiny, uh, but her, her, her thing is... Her star is lit very brightly right now. Yeah, it's bringing her lots of joy. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, uh, the Netflix show Tidying Up with Marie Kondo that's so popular, charities around the country are seeing a huge spike in donations. She told Colbert last night why she thinks her tips have hit a nerve in America. This is from last night. Why do you think Americans love your philosophy? And uh, you're cleaning up so much. Uh, I think it's that, of course, we all have problems tidying our homes, but it's not just that, Stephen. We all have clutter in our hearts, and that's what needs tidying. Oh. Oh. So that's the other thing is she doesn't speak English. So there's a translator that comes with her. She's kind of like the uh, the Amish that uh, build houses. Yeah, you know, if you hire the Amish, there's always a, a the guy know, who drives them. There's a Christian driver, usually a Christian, you know, driver that rides with him and brings him there, and then sits out in the in the driveway and waits for him. You know, I you always... need electricity, motor, you know, gasoline, engines. What do you need? I'm here for you. When I was younger, I always would be confused <laughs> because I would see, I think, the Metadites in the mall. And they, yeah. would, and they would get out of their minivans, and I always said to my mom, I said, well, why are those pilgrims wearing sneakers? Why yeah. are they driving vans? And, <clears throat> and I thought, and then I thought they were Amish, but they don't. You know, there's a, there's a very big distinction between the Mennonites and the, the Amish yeah. people. I wasn't aware of that, so. Yeah, I, uh, I was once at the casino, and everybody wanted to play with a Mennonite at the blackjack table. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I mean, they were lining up. It's like they'd never seen anything like this before. Really? No, I don't know if that ever happened, but it could. It could. I I've mean, seen if you him saw a Mennonite I'd, at the blackjack table, I'd sit down. I would. That'd be the first place I would go. He's got to know something I don't know. <laughs> um, but t- 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 he can clean house quicker than anybody or build a house mm-hmm. quicker than anybody. Yeah, that was a swing and a miss. Uh, let's see. But you ha- you do see them on the thruway or something like that. Yeah. And they're, at the, they're eating uh, Burger King or something. And some of them, um, they sell vegetables right out of the thruway stops. Yes, that is true. A uh, college student in Greensboro, North Carolina, heard a noise in her closet over the weekend. I can't believe this story. Uh, she thought it was a raccoon or something or even, even a ghost. But it turned out to be a guy that had broken in no. and started trying her clothes on. The student and oh. her roommate also had a break-in back in December. So now they're freaked out. And, they're, and, they're, and I would, by the way, I would totally move. Here's what they have to say here. I just hear rattling in my closet. Like, it sounds like a raccoon is in my closet. Put my hand on the knob, and I'm like, who's in here? And if somebody answers me, he's like, oh, my name's Drew. So I open the door, oh and he's God. in there wearing all of my clothes, my socks, my shoes, has a book bag full of my clothes, and he tries on my hat, 
goes to my bathroom, looks in his in the mirror. He asked like, he was like, you're really pretty. Can I hug you? Last night, I did not feel safe. Oh I slept God. with my roommate in her bed. I can't stay here. Like my closet, it stinks. Every time I go in there, it's like, a, it's a bad vibe. That's why I'm ready to just leave. Yeah, I'd leave. I'd get out of there. And, you know, what does this? Is it just crazy people or is it uh, drugs? I was sitting at the stoplight yesterday. I don't want to say where, but there was this kid. He looked completely normal, and but he was walking <laughs> like he, he looked like a zombie. And he was holding this weird cigarette thing. I don't even know what it was. And it was a vaping thing. He was vaping. But, you know, either there was something wrong with him or there was something wrong with him. But I do wonder, and, and what I'm talking about is sometimes what's going on is is they're, they're so addicted to some sort of a crazy drug that um, they just go out in public. They don't even know what they're doing. Yeah, this... Or they show up in some girl's closet, start trying on her clothing. That's super weird. And think weird. it's okay. I, it's it's very possible that this person was on drugs, but like, well, I, I, I don't know. You'd have to have the desire to... You'd have to have the desire, yeah, yeah. and then there's even the part where you he's somewhat concealing it, where he knows enough... Where he doesn't want to be just standing in her room when he when she comes home, so he's hiding to some extent. Yeah. Uh, and coming up, I have the story of all stories when it comes to your issue of quitting smoking. Oh yes. Um, I have the story of all stories. Okay. Um, that might be what is coming in the future. Where do you hear this proposal? I'm ready to be inspired. I hope that's this, what you're going to do. This might inspire you. I'm not sure if it's going to inspire you, but. Uh, it's coming up. Rachel Sutherland standing by now from Fox News. The president and Nancy Pelosi came to an agreement on the State of the Union. And it's tonight. And it's at 8 or 9 o'clock tonight. And the president, uh, a lot of people anticipating what's going to come from the president. Good morning, Rachel. A little preview. What are you hearing? Well, good morning. Well, there's some rumors in the air, and we don't know if they're true, that the president could use the State of the Union to declare a national emergency to get that money to build a wall, the ideas that tap into already appropriated funds in the Pentagon. That might be an interesting move for the for the president to make politically, but legally that could be challenging because it would uh, go to the courts. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're also expecting um, maybe more information about a second summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong Un. I would expect the president to tout the economy. Uh, it's been going well. Good jobs report out just a few days ago. Uh, expecting to hear more about Iran, ISIS, trade. So a lot of different issues to be covered, a lot of different topics, but I expect a good portion of it to be on border security. Yeah. Just so our listeners are kind of prepped for this, the last time we saw the president, I think he was only out there for, what, five or six minutes. <clears throat> Tonight's address will be the regular, right, almost hour-long presentation. He's going to hit on a, a ton of topics and it's going to seem like it's going to go on forever. I and think. it's a uh, this will be scripted as well, oh, un- yeah. unlike the president's uh, uh, campaign trips. Sure. And this is uh, has all the pomp and circumstance of the State of the Union. It's in the House chamber. Uh, you have the president walking in, shaking hands, the House speaker sitting behind him, also the vice president. It is a, a moment that is uh, considered politically significant for any uh, president. A lot of Americans go about their business like, what is this all about? Uh, yeah. The speech uh, last year, I think he went about a, an hour and 20 minutes, which was only second to President Bill Clinton, who's given the longest State of the Union in history. Uh, a couple of things I'm uh, I'm not wondering about and a couple of things I am. Uh, you know that when the president says something that uh, is more uh, from a Republican place, uh, Republicans will stand up and give him an ovation. Democrats will sit on their hands and vice versa. Every once in a while, if the, if the president mentions the military, um, uh, everybody will get up and stand. It's so predictable. Um, that whole part of it, I kind of hate. The other thing that is unpredictable, I do kind of wonder, will Ruth Bader Ginsburg make an appearance? She made a public oh, appearance yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder. You know, she's usually there, although sometimes some of the justices don't make it. Yeah. But that'll be interesting to see if she comes. Also, the guests that they bring, we're understanding that uh, the new representative from New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, is bringing one of the protesters that made headlines during Justice Brett Kavanaugh's nomination mm. to the Supreme Court. So kind of almost uh, trolling the president, because this is the woman who cornered then-Senator Jeff Flake in an elevator. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was uh, that was live on TV. If, uh, yeah. Yeah. Boy. Hmm. 
All right. Well, listen, it's uh, I would say this, Rachel, this one is highly anticipated based on everything that is that has been leading up to it. Do you agree? Oh, most definitely. I yeah. think a lot of people, th- th- besides the fact it was delayed because yeah. Nancy Pelosi canceled it. Crazy. All right. Well, it's going to be interesting. Right. We'll see what we're talking about tomorrow. Thanks. Great. Uh, Rachel Sutherland from Fox News. Quick break. We'll get back with Peter Franklin, the Gabby Cabby. How about when you go outside this morning and be like, is it like 50 degrees out? Yep, it is. It'll cool off. Did it off. hit 60 yesterday? It did. I I had 61 in the shade on a on a thermometer at my house. 61. Um, you know, that's not official or anything like that, but um, it was certainly upper 50s yesterday, and I think we broke some records. Peter Franklin coming up next. Hold tight to WIBX. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Live from the beautiful streets of New York. And, boy, this place is hopping. Hopping, uh, hopping, hopping. Well, it's been cold, and apparently the uh, inmates at the, uh, at, the, at the jail, is it in Brooklyn? Are all yeah. upset because there's no electricity and there's no there's no heat. What's going on? Most people don't even know if it's in existence. If you're driving through Brooklyn, let's say for argument's sake, if you were driving from Manhattan to Coney Island, you'd be going on the Belt Parkway, and you'd say to yourself, "That's some kind of official government building," but you really wouldn't know what it is. But as you get near it, it's like really scary. I mean, it's sort of like Alcatraz on land, and they really put some very very bad people there. Well. They uh, uh, had some trouble with the heat, the hot water, and what have you. And instead of taking care of it like they should have, they didn't. I mean, Brooklyn probably has about 18,000 plumbers. So whatever the problem was, yeah. it could have been fixed. And then the guy who's the warden, oh, boy, if he's listening, I'm in trouble, mm-hmm. must be the stupidest guy in the world. Because instead of taking care of the problem, he told all the lawyers and all the families that they couldn't come to the prison to visit their shivering prisoners. I mean, talk about uh, public relations fiasco. Yeah, yeah, not good. And then people showed up, like this state senator, that state senator. The, you know, the politicians all jumped on it, and he had them pepper sprayed. I mm. mean, which is, I mean, it's like the height of insanity. And and the interesting thing about it was that there wasn't a New York City cop to be seen any place near it. Because I had this gut feeling that they felt, hey, don't get us involved in that mess. You know, right. you got your federal law enforcement officers. Like you. Anyway, it's, it's the number one topic of conversation. And everybody starts off by saying, well, you know, they're mean, terrible, horrible people. But they don't deserve that kind of treatment. Uh, are you going to are, are you going to be starting a, a beach tour? What's going on here? Yeah, no, I do that during the summer, which also happens yeah. to be doing in Brooklyn. It's uh, I show people Brooklyn, yeah, and I tell them to bring either their shorts or even a bathing suit, and we stop at the Coney Island for a while. Uh, they have frankfurters and hot dogs and things like that, and then go on the roller coaster and I guess throw up. Yeah, but, you know, it's a nice day. And then you uh, and you'll be able to do one. Uh, you'll be able to expand the tour, right? To a beach in Manhattan. Yes, that is a novel thing. Uh, they're, they're building one. They say it's going to take a couple of years to do it. Um, I imagine they'll have to have some kind of netting or fencing going around if you're going to go into the water. Also, the question is, is the water polluted? Yeah. Uh, the city is claiming that it is, and so it's an interesting concept. And I have a uh, picture of it on the website, Gabby.com. Uh, You've got to be careful. You never know if a plane's going to land in the water or anything like that. These things can happen. That's right. Well, yeah. this is a very exciting, crazy place to live, uh-huh. but you've got your stories, too. Uh, listen. Listen, uh, Peter Franklin, uh, you have a tip that you're going to let everybody else know in the world right now, and it involves which former presidential candidate who lost and is female from New York is considering a run for uh, another, yet another run for president. Yeah, and the reason I'm basing that is that she and Bill uh, set up an office in in Harlem, and this was years ago. Uh, but the attitude, I think, at that time was they want to keep people of color happy. You know, they, you know. look, we have an office in Harlem. That, that means we really want to do it. Well, they've never closed down that office, and it's still operating, and people are still coming and going there. And uh, the, my prediction is is that if she plays her cards right, she's going to run again. Because, and she said that she might, right? She's not ruling it out. Yeah, and, I mean, yeah. why in the world would you continue to have this? 
big, large, full-floored office in Harlem if it wasn't her intention. Of course, their plot about being in Harlem bombed out when Obama showed up because yeah, that, yeah. you know, all of Harlem went for him. Uh, I want to ask it and just get out right, right out in the open and, and ask the question. Is Chuck Schumer running a sex palace in New York City? Oh, now you're going to be in trouble, too. <laughs> well, now, you know, you got a guy, one of his assistants... Uh, five and a half years he's worked there or something or other, has been thrown out because he was being a naughty boy. Now, you know, that's the second one from yeah. old Schumer because remember a guy named Wiener? Mm, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, that was his guy. So that's two from Chucky. Yeah. So, I mean, and look, they're falling around all about us. The guy, you got the guy in Virginia. You got uh, Cuomo now announcing that we're losing money on taxes because people are moving out of the state. I mean, we really have really a bunch of clowns running yeah. this country. Uh, it is the best tour in New York City. They'll take you all over, including the beaches, uh, some of them not even built as of yet. Uh, it's Peter Franklin. It's Gabby.com. And, Peter, we'll talk again next week. Thanks. You got it, sweetheart. Right. Bye-bye. Peter Franklin, the Gabby Cabby. Got a break here at WIBX. Good morning. People Good morning. like offensive games, so this is going to be... You're a, absolutely correct. This is going to be an offensive game. It is. Um, defense is boring. And look, I don't, I, you know, and I don't think it's it's an offensive game. I think it's just calling some things out that that have troubled me. Yeah. And, uh, and can you do, do me a favor? And are we still talking that? about the Super Bowl up, here? Upwards, upwards. Upwards. Yeah. There. Okay, I like that. Much better. <clears throat> much better. Much better. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's... just to introduce, uh, Ed Welch has announced a couple of weeks ago that he is not running for his uh, right. his seat, um, and uh, you are now announcing that you are running for the seat currently Correct. held yes. by him in the United County Legislature. Right. So um, I'm running as an independence. As an, ind- I'm, I'm independence. an I'm an independence. Independence registered voter. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, that puts a little bit of a twist on it. Mm-hmm. Um, There'll be no primary there, right? Uh, unless there's another independence candidate okay. out there who's right. going to uh, to look for the seat as well. So uh, certainly that. Which I can't uh, imagine that would happen. Never know. Yeah. Never mm-hmm. know. Um, and, uh, you know, with that, you know, I, I was I was kicking it around for quite a while. Um, and, and, you know, with business commitments and things like that, I, I have, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult sure. for me to yeah. go out and say, you know, I'm going to take all the time I need to run for mayor and all the time I need to run for county executive mm-hmm. or any of these other positions that, you know, I, I was many people talked to me about and said, you know, can you do, would you, could you, whatever. You've always said to us, um, I would have to be able to put the time into it. And, and put, you know, look, yeah, I, everything yeah. I do, I do 110%. Mm-hmm. Even yeah, this, is true. even this is, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, it's a part time. It's right. The, and and I, I can't do that. I can't do things part time. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it 110. And it is a big time for Oneida County. I really do believe that there's a lot happening right now. I think there's a lot happening, yeah. but you know, I think it's being kind of, uh, it, it's the things I see are, are problematic, and they mm-hmm. need to be taken care of. And, and there there's some misinformation coming out of the county building, and I think that that needs to be taken care of. And I think that needs to be some transparency. I think there needs to be some inner inner. Uh, some talks back and forth, and I think the county legislature really needs to start doing their job better. And yeah. I think that, that uh, there, I think, to, to go there to build a coalition of, of legislators who are like-minded, who want to see uh, themselves take a more active role in, uh, mm-hmm. in the way the county is governed and the way things are, are, are couched out to the public. You know, I mean, <clears throat> let's, let's look at a couple, a couple of recent things, obviously. Okay. And I started to go through this. Um, I, I was away for a couple of weeks, and uh, you know, while I was going through that, I mean, here I am, and basically paradise, and I'm, I'm on my computer looking over these things, saying, "Geez, well, you know, what about this and what about that?" Mm-hmm. One of the things that really pushed me over the edge was I was looking at the county budget online, um, and a few years ago, for whatever reason, they took the org chart off the, the the county budget online, so you cannot go online and look at positions and what they're paid. Now, why would you do that? Right. Why would right. you do that unless the county executive's office basically doubled their salary. I mean, from a few years back, it's about $400,000 a year. Now it's close to $800,000 a year for the county executive's office itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a substantial amount of money for one office, so executive level office or not. Um, <clears throat> you know, not to mention, you know, showing up places in a you know black SUV paid for by the county with an entourage. It's not necessary. It's right. just not necessary. I mean, as mayor of the city of Utica, I went everywhere by myself. Um, and, and only brought the essential personnel along. I think that's a necessary thing. So I, I find that you're so you're running on a platform that is pretty much. Uh, would you agree anti pacenti No, it's not anti pacenti You're going to be just, a thorn in his side. There's no doubt about look, it. Look, I, I, I yeah. want I want spending parity. 
for, for a person who's a major taxpayer, mm -hmm. I want spending parity. And moreover, I want parity for the city of Utica because that's not happening right now. And I know that you're an advocate for the hospital, and, and my, yes. the jury's still we've out with me on that. that. And we've yep. talked about that. Mm -hmm. But I still go back to why does the city of Utica need to pay $27 million toward a parking garage for a regional asset that will support other regional assets, mm -hmm. and no other part of this county is going to have to do that. Right. That is unfair to the taxpayers of the city of Utica to ask them to foot the bill for $27 million. And I think the county legislators who represent the city of Utica right now, to put that forward, have ceded their responsibility to the residents of the city of Utica by doing that and going along with that. Yeah. I don't think yeah. that should happen. It's a regional asset. <clears throat> if we were to build a parking garage at Griffith's Business Park, the county would foot the bill for that. But they would not ask the city of Rome to do right. that. They would ask the, 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 the county would do that. But your argument is, is <laughs> uh, and just looking, it, it's a procedural. You're, you're talking about... You feel that that Utica is getting a uh, Utica is not getting a fair shot because here. no one's standing up for it's, the city of Utica, it, which it is, I have a, a history which is much different doing, than that, which is doing. much different than standing up and saying no hospital red zone. Uh, you're not a member of the everything the has to make group. fiscal sense. And, Correct. And, and, and which, when we talk about fiscal sense, we talk about makes sense. We talk about taking properties off of the tax rolls, mm -hmm. moving them outside the city. Paying tax outside the city, which Oneida County will still receive their taxes, but the city of Utica will lose out on their taxes on this as right. well. And irrespective of a 2% up or down tax increase or decrease or what have you, this is going to come back and bite us now, down in the future. Now, I'll just throw you some low-hanging fruit um, <laughs> because I know what your response is going to be. Mohawk Valley Edge came out with a report that basically said Utica will be in a better place Financially, Mohawk Valley Edge has lied. I'm just throwing and, and, it out there. And you know what? And we're going to have a thousand to, um, jobs at Hill mm -hmm. and Marcy, too, aren't we? Uh, and that's going to happen exactly when? Steve? Steve? You there? No, yeah. He, he is. Okay. I'll tell you. He is. Boy, this is going to be an interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know what? It's. it's, it's <laughs> Dear Lord. Listen. Yeah. I, you know what? And, and, I, and I'm not angry, but it's just it's just time. Now, here, I'm going to show you something. And I'm, I'm going to point this out to, to Jeff here. Yeah. Here's a water bill, and, and irrespective of the amount on it. Yeah. Okay, this is one of my water bills. Okay. Holy I, cow. Okay. Yeah. This is the water charge here. This okay. is the Oneida County sewer tax. They call so it is this sewer the laundromat, so the reason it's yeah. high is that, yeah. yeah, okay. What strikes you about that? It's more than the water bill. What's more than the water bill? Uh, the usage tax. The sewer tax, correct. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Where you're paying more for the tax on something than you are... For the actual service itself. But we're going to sit here and talk about a 0% tax increase. Here's something else that's interesting, too. Uh, we, 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 we are going to, on the show, dive back into equalization rates. I want your thoughts on that. Okay. Let me, let me show you but, this, but, though, real quick. Okay, go real ahead. Quick. This is, I, I own a property in New Hartford, okay? This is the assessed valuation of the property in New Hartford, okay? okay? Yep. 84000 some odd dollars. Here is the county tax part of that. Six hundred and ninety-three dollars. Okay. Correct. Would that be correct? That's what it says. Yes. Right. Here is a house I have in Utica. Assessed valuation eighty thousand dollars. What's the uh, tax on that county tax? Almost a grand. So Almost a grand. So yeah. it's, it's it's about a three hundred dollar difference between Utica and New Hartford that Utica's paying more. Okay. Now let's go one step further. So why is that? Let's go way? one. Well, we're not done yet. But okay. Hold on. Sorry. Hold on. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of the game. What's the highlighted on the back of this say? Penalties accrue at 5% for the first month, 1% 1 uh, 1% per month thereafter until March 31st. After March 31st. Okay, that's is, fine. Yeah, that's okay. fine. So, so basically, if you pay your county tax bill in the city of Utica late, they charge you 5% for the first month and then 1% per month thereafter until March 31st. Okay? Down here on the New Hartford tax bill, it states if you pay your tax bill... By the end of February, you pay an additional. It's at ten and a half percent. Ten dollars? No. Oh, ten dollars. Ten dollars. Yeah. And that's on the whole bill. That's on the, the New Hartford tax as well as the county tax. So you're paying roughly ten dollars of a thousand is how much? Or ten percent. One uh, percent. Excuse me. See why he's on the radio, not a mathematician. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's actually pretty about, good at math. About yeah. about one yeah. percent. You're going yeah. too quick for me. Too. So one percent <laughs> compared to five percent. If you're in New Hartford, why is the disparity there? I want to so know why the disparity. So who sets those? And who sets those? That, those <clears throat> why those do we have rates? to pay? This, the county bills used to be very inexpensive. Yeah. County taxes used to be inexpensive, and now they're not. They're mm -hmm. not anymore. Why? It, we have to pay the entire chunk. Everyone has to pay the entire chunk right, immediately. Right. 
I mean, that's the thing you get. Okay, it's New Year's Eve. It's New Year's Day. Yo, how nice. Next day in your mail, what do you get? You get your county tax bill. Right. Well, that's the truth. I got you mine get, like the you, third You get your year. county tax bill, mm-hmm. along with all your credit card bills from the holidays, along with all these other things. And that yes, bill should be split up. Yeah. And should allow people to pay that mm-hmm. uh, and, and split that up like most places do that have an exorbitant tax bill now. And I think that that's something that needs to be looked at as well. <clears throat> And but again, here there's disparity here. Right. There's disparity here between the city of Utica and the town of Hartford, obviously with a very like assessed property. Mm-hmm. And there's a big difference there. And if you talk about this, they'll say, well, you know, the the equalization rate. It's not the equalization rate. It's not the equalization rate. This is Tony Carvelli in his typical smoke and mirrors that he's been doing to me and doing to the city of Utica residents ever since the ta- sales tax issue, which I was on way back when mm-hmm. in 2006, yep. has come forth. <clears throat> And this is what they do. And they send him out, and they go, oh, okay, well, send Carvelli. Well, you know, you got to have this. And this is, you know, no, isn't. And this is how Tony Carvelli sounds, mm-hmm. which makes it even worse to listen to him. <laughs> and with that, <clears throat> it's they're, they're, they're just blatantly coming out yeah. with misinformation to the, to the public. What it is, it's the MVCC fee, which legislators voted for, to allow the city of Utica residents to pay for MVCC, again, a regional asset, mm-hmm. and the amount of people you have from your municipality now that community has to pick up the freight for it, which has driven the taxes up in the city of Utica. And what the, my problem with that is the city of Utica, of, in and of itself, is kind of the steward of people who need an affordable apartment. Yep. Because we do have affordable apartments throughout the city of Utica. So with that, everyone who comes in from outside the area takes residency within the city of Utica, not to any fault of, of Utica residents, mm-hmm. but to the fact that the housing there is cheap and it's, and, and yep. it's affordable and it's available. And so we end up picking up the lion's share of the freight on these residents who come in to go to MVCC. And further than that, we don't even get to put people on the MVCC board. The city of Utica and the, and, and the mayor's office and the, uh, the common council should be able to put representation on the MVCC board. Because if we're going to be picking up the freight on it, then we should, it's just taxation without representation. It's the Rome, same thing that we fought back in 1776. Rome would have the same opportunity. should have the same should opportunity. should have the same opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. All these municipalities should. Yeah. It should not be a county executive laden committee with people going in there and saying, okay, I'm going to point you to the committee. You to the committee. No, the board should be made up of people from the communities now who are going to pick up this freight on this. You are uh, certainly not someone who, um, when you have an opinion that Shrinking you... Violet. you <laughs> Is that the term? You up? are... You're going to make some noise here. Well, look, and, and, and some noise should be made. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I think, I, you know, I put out some positions on, on, uh, on paper. Um, you know, I, I believe in term limits for all elected officials. I mean, from top to bottom. I mean, up to Washington D.C., right down to yeah. you know your local boards and things like that. Um, you know, so I think that clearly that in the race of the city of, of Utica, you you would disagree with the fact that the mayor has extended those term limits. <laughs> I disagree to allow with the, the fact that they did that, and yeah. I disagree with the council members who did mm-hmm. that as well. So yeah. I think that that's that's something that's uh, you know it, the, the the people voted on it. Mm-hmm. People should yep. vote and should have voted. To allow it to you know to extend optics, it to get rid of uh, it. Optics is not this mayor's thing, um, and on many different topics uh, yeah. over the last uh, few years. So, Manaski, well, can I ask you one of the things you said early on was combating county mis- misinformation that's right. coming out of the county? What what misinformation? Well, the misinformation that zero percent tax increase. That's a huge one. We're giving right, you a zero percent. Uh, let's get tax into increase. this. Let's go. I, I'd <laughs> like to get an expert on to talk more about this. Your understanding of how. For an individual in the county's tax bill continues to go up, even though the county is not right. quote raising taxes. Correct. Is let me ask you that. I'll cut right to the chase. Is this because of the land into trust? All that money's off the tax rolls, so now the burden, the levy gets gets spread among fewer landowners. Seemingly, that 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 could be part of it. You know, you would think that that could be part of it, except for the fact that the, and they never collected that tax anyway. So if that's the right. case, then they should be should, Which have been, is, should have been operating at a deficit so, for all right, those years, exactly. and they should be actually able to do it. So if that's not it, you know the answer. I, mean, I don't I mean, know why. Here's the problems. I mean, you got you know, you know where did the tobacco money go from? God knows when. Where did the well, uh, you know spent where, where, where did the Indian money go from years ago? Where did you know where did all these monies go? These one shots that came flying in, and, and better yet. Where does the additional thirty million dollars, thirty five million dollars of sales tax go, garnered by the extra point seven five percent that gets charged to everybody who buys anything in Oneida County or outside of Oneida County that gets shipped here? Right, right. I mean that's that's horrendous. That's horrendous, and it means that that this administration cannot budget itself and keep itself budgeted. Now we're going to go out and we're going to hire an economic development person. 
Economic Development Coordinator for Nida County. Isn't that Edge's job? And if it is Edge's job, then isn't it time you got rid of Edge? I mean, uh, I think a lot of people kind of felt that that was a, uh, I think a, was a bit shot of a, over the bow. I do think so. Well, um, you know what? With the, it, it certainly <laughs> had people. It certainly had people talking. I, I want to go back to the nano. Do you yeah. think it is a was was it? And listen, you were there in the mayor's office, and you know mm-hmm. about taking a shot, trying to make something happen. Right. Do you fault people like Griffo, Pacenti, uh, Brindisi? for taking a shot at what looked like was going to be a real opportunity. And certainly the state, uh, certainly the state through corruption, dropped the ball there. Oh, the state through corruption dropped the ball, yes. Yeah, yeah. But a billion-dollar shot, that's a heck of a shot. I, I, I get it, but <laughs> it's not. Would turn that down, though? That's, a fifth, down? Wall, that's but, a fifth of a wall. But that money came from, <laughs> but that money came from, that money came from, it's not like it came out of cut out of our pockets per se. Are you a New York State taxpayer? I, I understand that, but I Are you I, a New York State listen, taxpayer? I'm willing to go against oh, well, you on this, on this I, argument in that. You know that money's going to go somewhere else. It'll go to Binghamton. It'll go somewhere else. I, I guess that what, money's spent. I guess what I have is I have a concern with this Robin Hood mentality. Which we're I gonna get come, it. We're going to come down and we're going to grace you right. this. Well, the, well, the we game can, of... Can, the game can, of uh, can we have a billion dollars to do something that we actually yeah. need to have done? You know, and, and, and a little bit... I, I, I liken the hospital to that a little bit, mm-hmm. too. No one sat there and said we needed a new hospital until someone said, hey, we need a new hospital. Here's the money for it. And he said, oh, okay, great. Yeah. And, and on that subject... Something that's extremely, extremely concerning, especially to the 19th district, which I'm running in, of the Oneida County Legislature, is there is no reuse plan for St. Elizabeth's Hospital anywhere in sight. Right. And that's huge. That's going to yeah. be a huge. And, and, and let's However, go back to history. I'm, go, one I'm second. a let's go firm back to history. believer that we let's need go, a new hospital. Let's go back to history. Yeah. Steve DeMeo and Edge, who's mm-hmm. spearheading this project, which should concern us all to begin with, which is spearheading <laughs> this project, <laughs> was going to leave TRW, which mm-hmm. was across from... Chinatries on French Road, which was spewing PCBs into the sewer system and right into the actual Mohawk River all the way down the whole uh, storm sewer system, was going to leave that building on the landscape when it moved TRW out of there and up to the base. Steve DeMeo and company has a history of leaving depleted, used-out buildings in the city of Utica and not caring about the reuse of them and not caring about what is left over and what contamination is left over. That's his M.O. He's done it before. He's lied about it. And this, I, is, this is a concern. And this is a major concern to people in South Utica mm-hmm. who may watch that building turn into God knows what. I, I, I'm surprised you're not running for county executive. Well, I don't have the time commitments to do okay. that. I don't because you're kind of running against the county executive. I'm not running against the county executive. I'm I'm pointing out serious flaws Mm -hmm. that affect everyone in my district. I mean, the South Utica area where I'm running, which is the 19th district, is an extremely high tax base for the city of Utica and for the county and for the school district. It's uh, it's got this the hospital right in it. Saint one of the hospitals right in it, Saint Elizabeth's Hospital. Um, and, and these are things that affect all of us. I mean, the sales tax. I mean, if you if you are in a, a more affluent area, the sales tax is going to impact you more because theoretically you are going to buy more things, you're right. going to buy more expensive cars, so mm-hmm. on and so forth. So that three quarter percent sales tax does more. I, I, I am mm-hmm. almost out of time. Can um, I two things? Go ahead. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, here. I'm sorry. I'm here Bill. for you mm-hmm. guys. A text in <laughs> why not run for the Republican line? Are you still debating that? I know we kinda asked this earlier, but uh, if they have it, a Republican off if, the if table there, if there's a Republican candidate on there then it's off the table for me, yes. Okay. And there might be a Republican candidate. There probably will be yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is is on this Quarter of a percent, or three quarters of three quarters a percent. percent. Everybody pays that, right? Here's the argument: everybody pays that exactly. versus we take that off, mm-hmm. uh, and it's let's say it's eight percent. Then that gets spread amongst the property owners. Property owners You're correct. in favor of the property owners paying that. Difference? No, I'm in, I'm in favor of us looking over the entire county budget, cutting looking over it. the org chart, and c- figuring out where we can cut because I think the county is extremely top heavy. I think that the the workers and the places like social services and things like that don't get their due. I think that they are understaffed and overworked, okay? And yet, at the same time, we're turning around and we're hiring people at 80000 90000 100000 We're giving out raises. We're giving out raises to the county executive and to other elected officials that more than equal the minimum wage earners in the city of Utica. So you don't buy the justification that um, that our people here were making less compared to care. other. You they, don't buy they, that. They, they took the job knowing that. Right. They don't have to pay health insurance. They don't have to pay into the retirement system. Mm-hmm. They don't have to pay all these things that everybody else has to pay and go to work. They're not paying for cars. Can we do a part two on this? Because I, can I, I have this the is, DA waiting in the wings, and I and I, I, 
I almost feel like, I have I, and I knew I, this. I have There's a, no <laughs> way we're going to bring him in, and it's going to go for 20 minutes. It just can't. So, well, uh, I, and I want to give the, I, I need to give the county executive an opportunity to, to respond as well. give the county executive I, an opportunity to respond. He's going to give you the, he's going to give the, well, you know, I, I didn't really listen to Tony Julian when he was on here. I, you know, I, he's yeah. going to say what he's going to say. And I was gonna, you, okay, Tony, you, you're listening and your minions are listening up you, in your office. You might be um, such a thorn in Anthony Pacenti's side that you uh, will help Dave Gordon. And let me say to you, just for a moment. <laughs> Could you just, and I want an honest answer because you're always very honest. Forget yeah. politics, but be honest. Could you imagine Dave Gordon as the county executive? Okay. Just for two seconds, please answer that question. I have a race to run. I and, understand, and, but and, come on. Could you and, imagine? And I have seen. For I, look, 10 I have, seconds. Just, let's I have, dream about it. I have, Think of that nightmare. <laughs> oh, my God. Look, I, I, I can't sit here and say yeah. that the county executive's office is running the way it should run right now. I understand, so with, with but that, in I mean, comparison, and, and, in comparison, either way, I'm I have a race to run. I get it, and I am I am running that race, and I am not running. It, against you're the county running executive. it as you're I am fit, running against that. county policies okay. that have run amok, and that's Fair and, and if co- are costing and are dipping into the pockets of the city of Utica taxpayers, and I'm offended by that. And I'm a yeah. major taxpayer in the city of Utica as well as outside outside other areas. Too. I uh, I'm going to let Kathy get the final uh, question in here in Rome. You have a question or comment, Kathy? Um, uh, both. I uh, had paid my county taxes, and they'd gone up $33. And I remember a while back asking the county executive why the county bill wasn't uh, cut in two, and he said the state required them to have the money all in one lump sum. So hopefully maybe somebody can... uh, Shake the county up a little bit. Right. And, uh, do you think uh, do you think uh, Mr. Julian is the person to do that? You know, I was sound asleep. And when I heard him talking about the county tax bill, I says, that's our man to run for office for county executive. A, a that is a very nice thing to say to Thank Tim you very and, much, Kathy. And B, an awful thing to say to us. So uh, thank you for that, <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> I, I got Wait, prior to this, we were putting her to sleep. So <laughs> we, we got. All right, Kathy, you have a wonderful day. Thank you. He, you got to come back on so. and get more into this. But but I am out of time. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I look. You know, you know me. I'm available. Yes. And I've never shied away from a microphone. Uh, that is very very true. And I have uh, an eight o'clock and, slot and, open and, if you want. Until we to continue to talk about these things. Yeah. You want to wait for twenty five minutes? We'll <laughs> we'll have you on at eight ten today. We'll, uh, we will do <laughs> I it. Got again. You got coffee to get to. It. Okay. Uh, uh, go uh, enjoy the coffee and. Uh, so, well, thank you very much. I appreciate. It. I know it's first right out of the gate here, but I'm sure there'll be plenty more to. Well, talk about you came out of the gate, didn't you? We um, did. Yes, we did. you did. So That's the only one all right. To do it. Thank you. Coming up, we'll talk to the county uh, district attorney, Oneida County DA. Uh, Scott McNamara coming in in uh, a minute. Andrew on the line right now. We're ready to go. It's caller number what and what's the name? Caller seven. Sorry, it's Bill in New Hartford. On line one? On two? one, yes. On Is one. this our buddy Bill? <clears throat> William? Hello, William. Oh, I think it was. Bill, really? I can tell by the way he he hung up. He Call back, up. Bill. How did he hang up? Well, that's Bill for you. Uh, I'm just teasing William. William Bill. I got the, I mean, I, I, well, let's bring in the DA. We'll, we'll come back and do it. Uh, we'll give him the shot. Bill in New Hartford, if you call within a second here, let's see if this is you. Is that you, Bill? No. Uh, no, it's Hi. not Marie. Hi, Hi, Marie. Am I a winner? Well, I'm afraid Bill's gone, so I'm going to have to give her the shot, right? You're a winner, <laughs> all right. I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> I sure am. Thank you. All right. What's your, uh, what's your, tell us who you are and all of that. My name is Marie Boba. Hi, Marie. Uh, you got through. I don't know what happened to Bill. But you got through, so here we go. It's worth a hundred dollars from Joseph and Andrew Hobica, the Hobica Law Firm. Are you ready to go? You know yeah. the deal. You're going to have seven seconds to answer the question. Okay. All right, here you go. The founder of IBM was from what upstate New York City? Ready, go. The founder of IBM. 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 Thanks. Just throw it. Throw a city out there. Buffalo. Is it Buffalo? Anybody know the answer to that? Is it Rochester? No, no. It is, uh, the answer is Oneonta. No kidding. Oneonta. Yeah, George W. Fairchild was also a member of the House of Representatives, um, was the person who uh, ultimately was the founder of, of IBM. 
Can I Pretty give wild. you a two-second story? Uh, shit time, Marie. We're going to give you your choice of either a Babe's $25 gift card, the Babe's at Harbor Point, or, what a consolation, or 72 Tavern and Grill. A twenty-five dollar gift card. Tavern and Grill. All right. Oh, she's you, already decided. You sit oh, tight. Uh, Bill, Bill and, is Andrew's going to hook you up. Bill's on, on too. Tell him uh, we'll we'll give him a chance tomorrow. Okay. All right. I'll try not to butcher this, and I'll give you the thirty-second version. My uncle worked for IBM back in the eighties. Okay, and he was one of the guys who would like program computers. Mm. Super smart guy. Super smart. And they I'm had a- all the, uh, the the little cards, right? The, those <laughs> cards would. Uh, with the holes in them. That's what would run I, the computers. I, I think so. These giant know. computers. Very, very smart, very successful. Way out of my uh, stratosphere even mm-hmm. to understand the, what he did when he worked there, right? But he's so far out there that, like, simple things, anytime he would come home for the holidays, like when he'd leave, our computer wouldn't work, the answering machine wouldn't work. You know, He would touch all these things, and he would I, – mm. I, I don't understand, but it was always a funny – it's like a running joke. So he him. was good with uh, – he was good at work, but at home it was yeah. a disaster. Like he could, he could probably mm. reprogram your whole yeah. vehicle, yeah. but if he rode a bicycle, it would – you know, by the time he was done, it would be like a broken skateboard. It was just the funniest thing in the world. Uh, they say it about contractors, right? Um, yes. Right? They're yes. the ones that always have the unfinished kitchen. Yes, absolutely. Because right? they're all doing everybody else's work. Scott McNamara has announced that he is running for re-election on Oneida County DA. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Bill. So uh, you feel that you've made uh, Oneida County a better place, a more, I think the word you used was fair, a more fair uh, place. I hope so. I've yeah. done a lot to um, over my t- time as the district attorney to do that. Um, we... You know, one of the biggest things that I did, and I, I, when I put my announcement, I really didn't go into it, but one of the biggest things I, I hope I did and something I tried to do was in the office change the atmosphere of, of prosecutors. Um, when I started in the office, it was all about your conviction rate, winning. Um, I wouldn't say winning at all costs, but mm-hmm. winning was, yeah. was paramount. And um, the other thing was, um, you know, your conviction rate was something that was you know, people paid a lot of attention to. And you were promoted based upon how tough you were. And when I first started, one of the things that um, was pushed very hard was not to give the defense anything. Right, <laughs> you right. know, give them the, mm-hmm. basically the bare minimum of what you have to give them. And if you give them anything more, you you almost considered incompetent as a prosecutor. Uh, I've changed that environment in in my office and now i have open discovery i tell my assistants to give them everything and with the exception of something that's going to get somebody beat up or killed right right. um so and we've went to an electronic um discovery so we can do discovery at a very early stage we don't wait to the last minute we um i many times we're doing discovery before there's even an indictment some of the, the bigger cases defense attorneys have like for example the utica college case uh, Respondi had all that stuff long before there was even an indictment. We yeah, just yeah. gave it all. So, you know, that's one of the things that I've really tried to to push. That you know, we need to make sure the defendants have the information they need to make a you know a decision. Sometimes they're making decisions that's going to affect them for, you know, ten, fifteen years of mm-hmm. the, their life, and they should know what we have against them. You know, obviously there's there's certain things that you know I have a big concern for, and that's civilian witnesses identity and and personal information where do they live their cell phones i don't believe sure. we should give that right, up because right. we want people to cooperate but we don't want to be intimidated but when it comes to police reports and and um reports of that nature we give them up um we're one of the leaders and i is one of the leaders in the state on that it's something that you know i've actually been interviewed by the the governor's people before about how do we do that and and then sometimes when i have a little pushback on their discovery reform why is it that you know i don't think we should do certain things but we do other things so um you know that's one of the things i mean i i created a conviction integrity unit um I didn't do it to be one of the first. I I just did it at the time because I thought it was a good idea, and I did it as a direct result of Stephen Barnes. Um, I just I had my own personal story on Stephen Barnes. I I had known about his situation through my mother. Um, My mother had on many occasions um, told me that she thought that he was innocent. Um, in the DA's office when I started and as I started coming up through, it would be unheard of for an assistant district attorney to go in and look at a, a conviction of a, a high-profile homicide case and to question that 
conviction or to bring it to, to basically come and say, hey, listen, I think we should look into that. That would be unheard of. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe to the point where you would, you know, I, I don't know if you'd lose your job, but you sure wouldn't yeah, make yeah. friends in the office. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to change that environment. I had to change that the way we did work. Because ultimately, shouldn't it be uh, – I get it. You have one side working right. as hard as they can to win mm-hmm. and the other side working as hard and uh, as they can to win. And ultimately, that, we believe, will give the, a fair shake to, uh, to a defendant. True. But ultimately, it is to find the truth, right? Uh, from the prosecution side, it's always to find yeah. the truth. I mean, on the defense side, no, ethically, their job is to do whatever they can to get their client acquitted. Right. From our side, it is to find the truth. And one of the things that I push very hard in, in my office and with the people that work for me is – don't forget what our mission is. Don't forget what our brand is. Our brand isn't about winning at any cost. Our brand is about doing the right thing, doing what's right and fair. And and we try to do that every day. And, you know, with the Conviction Integrity Unit, now anybody can bring, a con- uh, if they have a question about a conviction, um, to the unit. It is in, it, in we, and I made it very... Um, open. So, for example, it doesn't have to be me that says, hey, look, take a second look. The defendants send in requests. Um, People that um, know about the case can send it in. Can you Um, explain more about this? Sure. You you didn't get into what the actual program is. Right. Sure. What our Conviction Integrity Unit is, basically, there's eight people on the panel. And if somebody claims that they're actually innocent or surprisingly, and this is where a lot of people, um, a lot of different offices don't do this, but we do, if they claim they're over-convicted. So, for example, sometimes people might say, hey, listen, I'm guilty. I was guilty of this, but I got convicted of something mm-hmm. else. Like yep. one of the, the cases that they reviewed, somebody had been convicted of attempted murder. He has already done his time, served his time, and is out of prison now. He wrote a letter saying, I, I should not have been convicted of attempted murder. I should have only been convicted of assault, mm-hmm. um, meaning he intended to cause her the injuries, but he didn't intend to kill her. So the unit looked at that and spent a long time, I want to say over a year, because that individual had written a, a book. It had never been published, so there was like a manuscript that he provided. Um, we all, they also had to go back and review the entire jury or the trial. It was a jury trial transcript. So – um, th- we they looked at that. Ultimately, they didn't side with him, but part of it was they interviewed him, they brought him in, they brought the victim in, and they they kind of reinvestigate the case. Mm-hmm. One of the thing, another case we did, a person claimed that he was innocent of the rape and, and brutal murder of an elderly lady um, at Five Nations um, down in Utica a long time ago. Um, and that was a case where DNA really wasn't used as much as it is today. So there was a few items of evidence that had never been tested. And he insisted that his DNA wouldn't be on it. So he sent in. Um, we paid for the testing. DA's office paid for the testing. We had to make him do that. And we sent it back out. And, you know, well, unfortunately for him, right, his right. DNA was where he said it wouldn't yeah. be. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and um, so, you know, but... But we'd look at them, even though sometimes, see, historically what we would have done was, you're convicted, stop already, I don't want right. to hear it. Everybody's innocent in prison, right? Every, right. right. And, and, and so what we do is we do look at them. We do go back and we do, um, you know, pay for the, the testing if there's something somebody wants tested. I mean, there was a, ca- there's a case that they reviewed, I think it was just last year, where we had uh, jail person that was in prison in a different state claiming they had information on a homicide saying that the person we had convicted was the wrong person. Um, I had to fly out one of my investigators all the way to the state of Washington. We interviewed that person, took a full statement from him. Um, he insisted if you go back and talk to you know these people, and he named specific people, they'll tell you that what I'm telling you is right and that they were there and, they, and it wasn't the way it went down. Well, when we came back, that wasn't accurate, but we, trace, we track all these leads down and we investigate them. Historically, that was never yeah. done. If somebody, we would never fly somebody to Washington State to interview someone claiming one of our murder convictions was wrong. Um, there's two cases right now that they're looking at. One's a case that was l- when I was young where oh. somebody's still in prison for um, – he was convicted of kidnapping. He was not convicted of rape. Uh, and I think the victim's name was Johnny Bell. Um, and that was, I want to say, in the, the 70s. And mm-hmm. that's a case that we're looking at because, you know, that person's still in prison claiming that he didn't kill him. And and now he's kind of claiming he didn't have anything to do with the kidnapping of him. So we're, that's a case we're looking into. Um, 
Wow. You know, so I, I, uh, we're talking to uh, D.A. Scott McNamara has announced that he is running for re-election. Um, I want to, about three minutes before the uh, the top of the hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if you can, we'll, we'll hold you over okay. um, if you're good. Uh, but I want to ask your thoughts on the governor's proposal. Um, this has been something that is done in other states, certainly mm-hmm. in Canada, um, where if someone's charged with a crime, we really don't know who that person is until after conviction. So that would include no mug shots, no names, no nothing. What's Police your take? Yeah. yeah. I don't agree with that. Um, I think the public has the right. Um, and there should be transparency. Um, people should know. Um, and here's the thing. There are, for example, if, if we arrest somebody that's a serial killer um, and we only arrest them on a minor charge, and now with the governor's other new proposal that everybody gets out of jail at arraignment except for violent felony offenses that, that the prosecution can prove mm-hmm. that they're a danger to the community and that they're a flight risk, um, that person's going to be released. Um, I think it's important for people to know um, what we need to continue to do, and I, and I don't th- think you throw the baby out with the bathwater. The problem is social media has changed yeah. the presumption of innocence. Right, right. I think it's important that we and, and people like myself, and I try to do it every time I talk about people, this person is presumed innocent at this point. These are allegations, and we need to prove them in a courtroom. Uh, you know, that's the problem. But, but I don't think um, changing something that's going to, I think, adversely affect public safety. People need to know who got arrested for what. Mm-hmm. Now, t- take, for example, if you have a, someone who's trying to lure people, and we recently had this, somebody from a different state was trying to lure um, young ch- girls, young children, um, uh, to a hotel That's room. A great example. Right. And you don't think that the public should know yeah, about yeah. that? What, well, what, he's presumed innocent, but... But if you see this guy showing up on right. you know on your daughter's um, mm-hmm. Facebook page, you got you, you should be, be concerned. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, because of social media, mm-hmm. um, and even before, uh, if it's a pedophilia case, mm-hmm. especially, mm-hmm. it can destroy someone's life. Absolutely, if especially if you find out later that they are not guilty. Um, there is that side of it you can understand. However, this would change everything as we know it uh, today. Um, the way we report. Mm-hmm. On uh, on court matters and crimes, it would really. This is a. I, I'm not sure he can get this passed, even with his Democratic controlled. <laughs> okay, and you laugh because <laughs> we're a little nervous. It's the a DA's little, throughout the state. Uh, uh, some of these proposals got they've got that out there. Democratic Senate. <laughs> I got everybody. Tell you. Yeah. All right, got a break. We'll take you on the other side. Hold on. We had a very fiery guest in studio. I only heard the end <laughs> of it. Yes, I know Tim. I've known Tim for a long time. I I, I think Tim's a good guy. Um, we, when he ran the last time, actually when he was, he got beat by Raffaro, um, we were on the same, within the same election cycle. So, um, and, you know, I remember being at a press conference with him and it's hard, um, especially when you're the mayor or things like that, if people blame you for crime and, you know, it's hard because you can't control crime. Yeah, what you yeah. can try to do is control our ability to investigate it or our, our ability to um, make the public feel safe. But if somebody does something really bad, it's hard. And I, and I remember we were at a press conference and there was a double homicide. And, you know, he was, you know, taking a little bit of a beating over that. But, you know, how can he stop that? You know, you, what, you, what you can do is you can put things in place to, to make, try to make things safer. But you can never stop bad people from doing bad things. Right. And, uh, Tim is a, um, someone who does not hold his opinion back at all. That's for sure. <laughs> and, uh, and it, uh, boy, it sure sounded awful like he was running against uh, Tony Pisani and, and not running for a, a county legislator seat. So Yeah, I like Tony. Tony is a good friend of mine. And, yeah. you know, and I think um, one of the things I got to say that's happened in, over my career Career and with Tony's leadership, and I think it's important, is our relationship with the United Indian Nation. Um, that's, t- for me, as a DA, that's huge because having the United Indian Nation be deputized and have them being treated as police officers in the state of New York and all working together um, is, in my opinion, is huge. And, and between Ray Helbreder and Tony mm-hmm. Pacenti making that work, it makes the whole county safer. And, you know, that's one of the things that I hope I can do um, if I'm reelected going forward. One of the things we're, we continue to try to do is to try to work together, do more with less, 
Um, you know, I'm, I, I think any time that we can reduce taxes and reduce the burden on the taxpayers, you know, don't keep hiring more and more police. You take the police have and utilize them better. And, you know, and I got to say, Ray Halberter has been very good at that with, with his police department. Um, you know, one of the things we're doing right now in Utica is we're creating a we created a unit, um, the chief, myself, the sheriff got together, um, and we created a unit that actually do- analyzes the phones and the computers because we kind of looked at We had a couple um, trials um, last year. They were not guilty, and we were looking, what is it that we could do better? What did we leave on the table, so to say? say? And, you know, cell phones is huge. Anytime that you have cell phones, anytime you have electronic uh, evidence, um, and we were relying really heavily on Utica College and really not getting the turnaround that we wanted. So, you know, we got together. We created um, this unit. Uh, Greg Fischel from Utica Police Department heads it up. I know just recently um, New Hartford had reached out. They want to have somebody trained to do that. Um, that's the wave of the future. And well, I, you've had a um, – I mean, the the – the trial of uh, Conley. Uh, Conley, Conley trial was huge. Alone I mean, that, was that, that whole case revolves around completely that changed what I Google. Um, I am very <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's at least all the uh, history deleting mm-hmm. software. Yes, uh, at least on my own devices. Um, I gladly Google something on someone else's. Uh, but uh, but it's I hate to say it, it's true that. Um, you know that cocaine was the uh, right. was the drug, and the question would be, um, why was that being searched why on that phone? Search? And, and other yeah. and other poisons yeah. being yeah. searched. Why would you search those things? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, in in but going right now, I mean, we have some very high profile cases, and what the people were doing beforehand is going to really be important to determine whether or not um, an insanity defense is going to work. So sure. that's why, if you notice, the Utica police put out the thing: we're looking for a certain cell phone. We continue to look for that. Those things are important. And, and once again, it's about being fair. If yeah. if one of those or both of those people were um, suffering from a mental disease or defect at the time they committed the crime to the point that they didn't know what they were doing, then they shouldn't be in, in prison. They should be in a mental hospital for the rest of their life. So, you know, that's very important. And, and to have that evidence makes a big difference. I mean, Tashiana Hills, that was a case we just did. And the forensics in that was very important for our um, forensic psychiatrist to be able to come to um, his conclusion on whether or not she was mentally ill at the, to such a point that um, she didn't understand. So, you know, we created this unit. Um, I, the, the chief, the sheriff, myself have all committed resources to it. Um, fortunately, I've been able to use forfeiture money because it is a law enforcement purpose, so it's not costing the taxpayers anything. Um, you know, that's one of the things we continue to work on, too, is looking at, you know, major drug dealers or people that are involved in criminal activity and trying to take away the, the, the proceeds of that activity. So there's a lot of things we're doing and to try to keep the, the, you know, the taxes down for the people and working together. And, um, you know, and I got to say, Tony's been a great partner, and so has um, Ray Helbreder and, and all the chiefs throughout yeah. the state, um, or the county, I'm sorry. Do you, uh, w- in closing, mm-hmm. um, take a few minutes to give your case, state your case on, because um, that's what you, you attorneys do. You state, you <laughs> state your case. Uh, uh, why, uh, of, the, of the accomplishments that you feel, beyond what we've talked about, that you feel are are uh, are important to the community and important to the voter who's going to decide whether or not to vote for your reelection. I think the most important thing for for the district attorney is to have experience. I think it's very important to have experience and to have a track record that people can trust you. Um, the, being the district attorney is a very important position. It's unlike any other elected position. And honestly, um, you know, you shouldn't be political. Um, you should not get involved in politics. You should come to work, do your job, and um, and do the right thing. And do the right thing when people aren't watching. And, you know, and I would hope that that's my history. That's my track record. That's what I try to do every day. Um, I make very tough decisions, um, and I can make those because of the, the 26 and a half years I've been in the DA's office. Um, you know, we, don't, we make decisions sometimes that are unpopular with the public, but we have to follow the law, and that's very important. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and, and the other thing is what can, what can 
a person in a DA's position do, and one of the things I've tried to do, is to mend the gap between law enforcement and the community we affect the most, which is typically a poor community or, or minority community. And I mean, one of the things I was very proud of last year is that I got a diversity award from the NAACP. I mean, I've done a lot. I mean, I, you know, actually I hired Patrick Johnson to be the community liaison, and I continue to do that. I've increased the amount of um, female prosecutors in my office, and I, I continue to do things to make um, my office um, more um, diverse and to, to look at things. And that's very helpful when mm-hmm. we look at cases. You want to have diverse opinions um, and and you want to look at each case and, and analyze the case. And that's the thing that we do every single day. And I'm very proud of the people that work for me. And, it, and that's the other thing. It's not just me. It's a team yeah, that I yeah. have. And, and, you know, whether it's Mike Calusa, Don Lupe, or, or my young assistants, um, you know, Rebecca Kelleher or Maria Blaze that's in city court, we're a team. And, um, and we all work together. So, you know, I've I been doing this for a long time. I bring a lot to the table of experience and, and, and honestly the most the thing I want to say to listeners is this it's been my honor to serve this community for twenty six and a half years, first as an assistant and then as a DA. And um there's I would have never imagined this back in the seventies when I was a a young person in Waterville school. I, I mean I've been able to live out something that I wanted to do, my dream to be um, a prosecutor. And I got to do it in my, you know, I got to do it in my home county. And I got to represent the people that I grew up with and to this day and the people I've met. And, and this is the community I live in. And this is the community I grew up in. And it means the world to me to do this job. And, and I'm very th- fortunate and very thankful that I've had that opportunity. Uh, Scott McNamara, I do want to tell you that um, when you speak, we do listen, and uh, Deansboro is now in the song. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, it's there, and at some point we will take you up on that sub uh, I'm, sandwich. I'm offer. still waiting well, for you guys wait, to come chicken down. wings. I think it was the, the deal was chicken wings. Oh, okay. I don't think it was all a sub. But. Okay, I'm craving carbs. <laughs> for the record. <laughs> craving carbs. Uh, all right, Scott, thank you. Thanks for having me. We'll out. do it again. Such a big time uh, for this in this country today, but Robert Moses is a Hamilton grad, one of the most influential black leaders of the civil rights struggle, founder of the Algebra Project, which we'll talk about, and so much more. Uh, He's a 1956 graduate of Hamilton College, and he will be speaking at Hamilton this week, and he's coming on the air with us in a few minutes. So it's uh, we're speaking to some a legendary uh, member of the civil rights movement uh, coming up. Uh, should be very interesting. We'll do it in a few minutes. Uh, in studio right now is Diane Kupperman. Do I say that properly? You did. Okay. Uh, Diane is the CEO of the uh, one of the great organizations out there, Make-A-Wish. And you handle, what, seven counties? Fifteen, 15 counties, counties throughout the central portion of the state, hence wow. our, New York, our, our title, Central New York. Uh, and you have an event that's coming up on Sunday, February 17th. And uh, the tie with Utica College is uh, is really big. Talk about it's that. It's really great. Yeah. Thanks to Coach Heenan and his you know philanthropic nature, he has helped us create this event to not only create awareness for mm-hmm. wishes, but to raise money that it takes to make them come true. And we're just so grateful that he and the guys in the middle of a very um, busy time for them yeah. take time out of their Sunday to help make wishes come true. So what happens on the 17th? Um, it's the second annual it, Hockey for Wishes. So explain what happens. It's a brand environment there's raffles photo booths and and one-on-one access with the players Mm -hmm. we auction off five of the players but every table who comes will have a player or coach at their table so it's just a fun way to really meet the players get some one-on-one time with them learn a little bit more about Mm -hmm. them and um, and support Utica Hockey and make wishes come true. Nice. This is open to the general public, or it you have Make op- a Wish families that. Well, we have families come. We'll have Wish kids come and escort the players. But this is open to the public, open to families, open to kids, adults, and really just everyone who wants to help make wishes come true for us. Right now, we have of the hundred thirty-three wishes that we have in process, and that's about a sixty percent year-over-year increase. Mm. 34 of those are for kids right here in the Mohawk Valley. Wow. And at an average cost of $12,000 a wish, you can see how important fundraising and awareness are yeah, to helping yeah. us say yes to every eligible child. How does it work? when? Uh, so there's a child who has, God forbid, a, a terrible illness. 
do who reaches out? How does how does this process work? Well, we have to be invited into the child's mm-hmm. life, so we prefer the referral come directly from the parent, so yeah. that they are inviting us in. But often it's the a family member will tell the the family that knows of the child with critical illness about Make a Wish. Sometimes the doctor tells the child about Make a Wish. Sometimes the kids themselves make the phone call. Mm-hmm. That's always wow. fun. But once the child is referred to Make a Wish, then we are in contact with their primary care specialist, who is the one responsible for what would qualify them for the wish. And based on national medical criteria, it's the physicians who determine whether or not the kids are eligible. So you know the kids that we're working with um, have very serious Mm -hmm. um, life-threatening and critical illnesses. And but a wish makes a difference. We know that. We've seen it time and time again. And probably um, so many cases, right? These are children that this could never happen for them if it wasn't for this organization. So often. Because their families couldn't afford it. Especially they're going through, oftentimes they're just going through uh, uh, terrible medical expenses. Terrible medical expenses. Yeah. And it's not something they're thinking about. They're thinking about all the pressures of their life. Right, right. And whether it's a trip to Disney World or something highly inaccessible. We had 14 kids from around the country at the Super Bowl this weekend. You know, wow. it's really not about the cost. It's about that child's wish and what's going to propel them to hope and looking to the future. Right now here in the Mohawk Valley, we have, as you, if anybody was at the game Saturday night, they saw that Mackenzie's wish mm-hmm. to go to Hawaii will be granted. We have lots of Disney wishes. We have some couple unique ones, so sometimes it's not the big. We have a little guy who wants to play with a room full of corgi puppies. Now, finding corgi puppies has really been a bit of a challenge. Right. But it's as sweet as innocent as playing with puppies. And we also have a young man who wants an indoor batting cage and half-court basketball. So he's not thinking about being sick. Right. He's yeah. thinking about continuing mm-hmm. yeah, to be an great. athlete. I remember as when I was in kindergarten, there was a classmate of mine who uh, is still a buddy of mine to this day. Uh, but he was dealing with a form of a cancer at five years old, and he was a make-a-wish child. And I'll never forget, he went away. We were all like, oh, my gosh, he's going to Disney. And he, he ended up getting photos and lunch with Arnold Schwarzenegger when you know he was wow. a superstar, when he was at the height of his mm-hmm. movie career. And I, to this day, I remember, you know, we were all going through the pictures. We, we you know, we were all, uh, it was probably only 15 kids in the class, but it was like a show and tell yeah, thing that yeah. went on for like a whole week. Well, you know what, Jeff, that's part of the magic of Make-A-Wish because we change the story for these kids. They're no longer the sick kid with cancer in school. They're that normal kid yeah, or they're yeah, the yeah. kid that got to go to Disney World right. to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger or to have um, a basketball court in their backyard. So we really help change that story and shift it from the focus on being sick to the focus yeah. on being normal, whatever that is. Right. But for a moment in time, that wish can change a child's life. And and a lot of times this is not, in some cases, that would be terminal, right? The, uh, the disease, whatever, um, could be terminal, but it also might not be, right? That's they right. might Our be stories- fighting the fight of their life. And this could be a, really this joy that a kid gets to experience as part of the part of the treatment. You know what, Bill, you hit the nail on the head because, you know, who knows, right? right there right. are illnesses that the medical world has determined terminal, right? but who knows? Really, mm-hmm. it's really out of our hands. And so our stories are a mix of happy and sad endings, but there is absolutely no doubt that a wish is about hope mm-hmm. and what's possible and about the future. And we've seen over and over again, if you really believe in the power of positive thinking and the power of hope, in fact, there are some studies now, medical studies that are showing physiological impact on kids have or who are waiting wishes and and it changes their wow. outcome uh so the website is cny.wish.org that is correct um and for reservations you could go there it's 40 dollars a person doors open at 10 a.m on sunday february 17th and the event begins at 10 30 again 40 bucks a person uh you could also call and make a reservation to get information at 315-475-WISH and the partnership with UC uh, is is pretty big. It's fabulous. Yeah. Come one, come all. It's going to be a fun day. All right, Diane. Thank you so much. Again, that website is cny.wish.org or call 315-475-WISH. One of only two African-American students graduating from the class of 1956, Robert Bob Moses, uh, is coming to town on Wednesday, February 20th. Uh, to do a lecture on mathematical literacy and civil rights. It's going to be very interesting. And it's an honor to have him on the radio here with us here this morning. Bob, good morning. Morning. So uh, tell me, first of all, what it was like to be one of only two African-American students and what life was like in 1956 for a college basketball player. 
<laughs> well, playing basketball was uh, good at Hamilton. Um, you know, um, it was seamless with your studies. So, um, and, you know, we weren't in Division One. Yeah. Right? So there was no pressure. Um, and uh, Coach Patrick was really uh, good to play under. Um, yeah. At that time, of course, um, the idea, there wasn't an idea that African Americans play basketball. Yeah. Right. Um, there hadn't been any uh, African Americans in uh, pro basketball up to that time. Um, so anyway, it was a good experience at Hamilton yeah. playing basketball. Were there, were, 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 were there places that you that that you did play on the road that were difficult being black? Mm, no, no. I mean, we didn't dip south at all. Right, right. Yeah. And you know some of the stories uh, uh, from Syracuse as they traveled uh, uh, into the south were just uh, were horrible. Um, uh, yeah, and, no, yeah. no, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't go south at all. Right. Um, yeah, we pretty much stayed in New York State and then also Massachusetts. Uh, tell me if you could. You you've done so much during your your life after after Hamilton. One of the things that uh, you did uh, back then uh, was in the in the nineteen fifties and early sixties, student nonviolent coordinating committee and a central organizer of the Freedom Summer Project. Which in nineteen sixty four you uh, were were working to register African Americans in Mississippi. Yeah. So. Um... I left Hamilton and did uh, some work at uh, Harvard Graduate School uh, and then um, was teaching math in New York. Um, and when the sit-in movement broke out in February of 1960, uh, and I, it really grabbed me um, in part, of course, because of the experiences I was having at uh, Stuyvesant High School in New York, Hamilton, and then Harvard, um, really isolated as an African American in uh, uh, these educational environments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I I went to visit my uncle Bill, who was uh, teaching down at Hampton Institute, to see the sit-in movement up close. And uh, the students there were sitting in at Newport News and Wyatt T. Walker, who later became the uh, executive director of King's organization, mm -hmm. um, came and gave the mass meeting and announced that uh, Dr. King was going to set up an office in Harlem where I was living. Uh, so the rest of that spring, I would volunteer and Bayard Rustin, who uh, actually were conceived and organized the March on Washington, was running that office. Um, I asked him if I could go down and work with uh, SCLC and King uh, that summer, and he sent me to Atlanta to Ella Baker. Um, Ella was, at that time, the executive director of SCLC and uh, she was the one who had created the space for the sit-in uh, movement leaders yeah. to own their own movement. Mm -hmm. And so um, she then sent me that summer on a trip through Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, looking for uh, evidence of sit-in movement. They They didn't have any. Uh, evidence about the sit-ins in those deep <clears throat> south states uh, and to recruit young uh, African Americans to come to a fall conference. When I hit Cleveland, Mississippi, uh, in the Delta, Amzie Moore, who was head of the NACP there, uh, was the one who told, who said what the students should do. They should, 
He said, we, you guys need to come and do voter registration work. Yeah. Right. And so I had a year to go on a contract I had uh, teaching math at Horace Mann School in New York. So I told him I, I want to come back and work with you for and uh, SNCC on this voter registration mm-hmm. problem. Yeah. And I did. Excuse me. Yep. So do you, um, what do you say to students today? Um, obviously, you'll be, uh, you'll be speaking in front of students and faculty on the, on the 20th. And math is, uh, is part mathematical literacy, but also civil rights. What, what do you say to students today? Uh, basically, I point their attention to the preamble. So the preamble um, is interesting and really important, um, and um, it's a kind of base camp uh, for anyone who really wants to uh, change in uh, some radical way yeah. what's going on in the country. I mean, if you think about Judge Taney in 1857, who was the chief justice of the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case, right? So he he lit the fire which uh, uh, sent the country into its civil war. And he did it by uh, telling people what the preamble meant, right? Mm -hmm. And what he said at that time was that the preamble is just for white people. It has nothing to do with Africans who have come here, whether they are slave or free, uh, and um, they are not and cannot be uh, in any way part of what he called the political community Mm -hmm. formed by the preamble, right? And that sent us into the Civil War, uh, you know, uh, with... Lincoln leading the charge, right? So um, we're faced today with a crisis in the preamble. Now, in some sense, the Africans in those days, right, were the country's undocumented people, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, Africans were uh, really fighting to change their constitutional status, right? The uh, insurgent runaway slaves, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Article 4, Section 2, Paragraph 3 of the Constitution, uh, but it's the part of the Constitution which identifies another class of constitutional people, Africans who are constitutional property. Right? Mm, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so the country goes to war over these two uh, different ideas, right, um, constitutional people versus constitutional property um, and comes out uh, and and um, are you familiar with uh, um, um, oh, I'm blanking on it um, circular 3591 I'm afraid I'm not okay so um, Francis Biddle he's uh, attorney general in, on December 12, mm-hmm. 1941, issues Circular 3591. Um, and he tells every state uh, prosecuting attorney that they need to stop prosecuting vagrancy as uh, poverty uh, when people are rounded up for not having any means to live. Um, and prosecuted as involuntary servitude or slavery. Mm-hmm. So what's going on? Well, five days earlier, uh, Japan has invaded Pearl Harbor, and Roosevelt now needs young black men, right, in his armed army that he's getting ready uh, to send to fight into World War II. And so he brings to an end a practice that rounded up tens and tens and tens of thousands of young black men uh, and sent them into the mines uh, and the plantations, right? So in some sense, coming out of the Civil War, um, the country reverted, right, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and under this doctrine of states' rights, um, which was a doctrine that, uh, as vis-a-vis African Americans and their civil rights, uh, was not in play uh, for three quarters of a century from 1787 to the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, it, at that time, it was the rights of the property owner, right, uh, that was protected against states' rights, right? So um, the fugitive slave law laws, you know, which allowed people, uh, which said that the federal government, right, following this Article 4, Section 2, Paragraph 3, uh, the federal government has the right to come and get yep, yep. right? So, so the issue um, facing the country today um, really can be crystallized around the question of uh, what I call sharecropper education. Um, I was on the witness stand in 1963, um, and we had taken sharecroppers down to register to vote, uh, and our cases had been removed uh, after they arrested us to the federal district court in Greenville. We, we were working in Greenwood. Um, and Burke Marshall was the uh, assistant attorney general for civil rights under Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. So um, the judge just had one question. He wants to know, well, why are you taking illiterate down to register to vote? So basically we said, well, the country can't have its cake and eat it too. Mm-hmm. Can't have denied a whole people access to literacy through politics, and then turn around and say, "Well, you can't do right, right. politics, right? Because you're illiterate." But the issue of sharecropper education was, well, um, you're pre-assigned work, and so at best you get the education for which you've been pre-assigned. So, in some sense, the whole country is facing the issue of sharecropper education, mm-hmm. um, in the sense that. Predominantly, people, young people, uh, unless they're in, you know, a very elevated economic class, are getting an education tied to the work of the 20th century mm-hmm. and the industrial yep. technology. Yep. And the country hasn't retooled, right, uh, to uh, look at the work, what the education needed for the work of the 21st century and information technology. Mm -hmm. And so it's caught up with the whole country in the last presidential election. How do we uh, how did we go from Obama uh, to it seemed that, you know, we have our first black president and it almost seemed like the country took a sigh of relief that 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 it's over now. We have we have accomplished this problem. And uh, yet today, if the racial tensions seem to be higher than ever from in the NFL to we have this- yeah, no, 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 no. No, that's a misreading of what went on in the country. Um, the civil rights movement opened the doors, right? Right. And it opened the doors for a few, um, if you like, young African Americans like myself, mm-hmm. who had gone through elite education like Hamilton College, right? It did not open the doors for the mass of African-American people. Yeah. Right. It didn't. And, of course, the Democratic Party slammed the door in some sense while it opened a a little window uh, when we took uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to the 1964 Democratic Convention. Right. Lyndon Johnson. I don't know if you saw his movie All the Way. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so, um, so in some sense, um, there's um, the um, uh, judge wisdom of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued the the opinion in the Louisiana versus U.S. voting rights case in December 1963 about a month after Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. Um, And what he said, he went back into the history of Louisiana, and what he said in his opinion was that the southern wing of the Democratic Party 
had been the manifestation of white supremacy for three quarters of a century, right? And so you could not uh, allow the state of Louisiana to say who could register to vote or not in the end, right? You had to Mm -hmm. transfer that. So this is a big deal, transferring that authority. Now, the Roberts Court has upended that, right? So we're back. We're not quite back to, you know, zero, but um, we're back to struggling also about the right to vote, right? So um, what happened was, you know, a few people got through, uh, and one person got through all the way up to the president. Right, right. Um, but so that did not um, really solve the, the issue that yeah, we're yeah. facing today, right? I, or have been facing, you know, since the country was founded. And just and just when you think that um, you know we've moved forward, we have a Democratic governor in Virginia who's pictured in 1984, or says he wasn't yeah. pictured. I mean. That story is just crazy, and that's 1984. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's interesting to me that the country, all of a sudden, it really isn't cool to be a racist. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, the country, uh, so in that that sense, the country has kind of moved a little, Mm -hmm. um, but it, it hasn't moved. Uh, to the point where the institutionalizing of racism yeah. uh, has been addressed, and certainly not in right. the education of young people. Uh, Robert Bob Moses will be uh, is a 1956 graduate of Hamilton College, civil rights leader in America, and the topic is Mathematical Literacy and Civil Rights Wednesday, February 20th at 4 p.m. at the Kennedy Auditorium, Taylor Science Center at Hamilton College. It is free and open to the public. And, Bob, thank you so much. I wish we had more time, but thank you so much for taking the time with us here this morning. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Take care. Thanks so much.